The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Now we all know that there's a point where darkness is going to overtake light in this world. God said so. He will wear out the saints of the Most High. That's what that means. That means darkness will have its way over the saints. But it does not mean that darkness is going to turn you dark. And it does not mean that the area that you occupy has to be dark either. It just simply means that the will of darkness will be established above the will of the righteous. But don't be frightened by that. Many people are frightened by that, even by the concept of the beast, because they don't know who they are. So we're going we're gonna to examine that. You have to know who you are before you really comprehend the time frame. Because if you don't know who you are, fear is going to begin to think for you. You're going to be a denier of prophecy to a certain degree. You will not accept God's prophecies. And these events in the world are going to blindside you. I hate to say it, but those in, those in Hawaii, they did not expect that fire, did they? Please don't think I'm cold by using them as an example either. Because they are us and we are them. So it's going to happen everywhere. It's going to happen to all of us. It would likely benefit us to pay attention to what's happening in the world. Not just to be so disgusted by the activities that we, you know, lose ourselves, but to be sober and to understand something. That can happen anywhere. And if they were caught off guard, those people, you know, when you see those interviews, people were on vacation. They did not plan for that to happen. But what has been happening, let me show you how God works. What has been happening over the last three years in Hawaii? What has been happening? They've been having volcanic issues. You may not know this, but do you know Maui is named after a, 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 a demigod? Did you know that the local population believes in that demigod? Do you know that they pray to that demigod? They make peace offerings to that demigod. Hopefully you know that. So there are people who are good people in that place that like they know nothing about the worship of certain gods in Maui. They don't know about that, but they were there anyway. They were unaware of it. And so here's what I'm telling you. If you think that what you don't know won't hurt you, you're wrong. What you don't know that you've been given an opportunity and soberness to really consider, but you just simply disregard it, you're going to pay the price with those in that plan. The Lord keeps warning us, come out of her, my people, be not partakers of her sins, that you don't partake of her plagues. So what would what would people partake of in Maui that is so bad? That those little dances, traditional dances, and those things they do, you know, those are dedicated to a demigod. And I know I sound cold, but what happens when it doesn't stop? It's not going to stop with Hawaii. It's not going to stop there. We're going to have fires in America. What happens when Las Vegas blows up? All right, they got nothing to burn. But they do. It's right underground. What happens when that whole place goes up? How many innocent people are going to be in Las Vegas having nothing to do with gambling or anything else? Or just simply, you know, taking a vacation. Maybe they think nothing is wrong with walking around. I'm telling you right now, whatever place you're in, you partake of this stuff and blindly ignore what the Lord has had exposed about these places. If you ignore it, there's a price to be paid for it. Because people, you know, we can't walk around believing in Christ and honestly believe that, uh, you know, people are finding out things on accident. we got to stop thinking like that. God makes things known. He wrote that in the book. God does this. God will use the unrighteous to make his truth known in the world. Don't, don't, we should know this. He'll utilize his creation to do the same thing. Upon seeing these things, we have a choice to make. We can still, you know, get our boogie down amongst this uh, this world of entertainment stuff partaking of these activities that the Lord certainly would not have happened in the kingdom of God or we can sober up and say you know what the Lord probably is not pleased with this all, all the people who died establishing this place did not die so they could do that you, you have to think about that people didn't come over here and die in vast numbers so they could go over there and, and party it up for the sake of what? money, greed and what is it feeding? is feeding a lust within the flesh, causing people's flesh to be strong for gambling, which, by the way, destroys people's lives. And how many people make an excuse for gambling? They go get a simple scratch-off. Well, it's not bad. Sure it isn't. Until you do that for 10 years in a row, and you have spent a million dollars on scratch-offs, when you could have done something else with that. I have a disdain for the world, I do. For the stuff in the world, not for the people, not against the people. Because a lot of people are being used by dark forces. If it were not for Satan, I'm, I'm going to show you guys something. A lot of people, they point fingers at people. 
Well, guess what happens when Satan is bound a thousand years? There is no sin on the earth. That's what happens. So when Satan is bound a thousand years, there's no sin on the earth. In fact, it's a thousand years of peace. When Satan is bound a thousand years, there is a thousand years of peace. Why would that be? Because it's his influence that amplifies these uh, uh, certain chemicals and mindsets and thoughts within people that cause them to agree to the sin. He's constantly doing what he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's constantly doing it right now. And when people fall for it, they build these places like Las Vegas. They build weapons of war. That's what they do once they give into it. Well, did the, did the Lord ever write that we are to partake in these entertainment factors of mankind? That we are to, you know, you know help them out in their quest to, over, to, to overcome all flesh? No, he did not. In fact, he said, separate yourself from it. He made us separate. He deemed us holy, which is separate, called out of these things in the world. Don't you know that? We should know that. We should really honestly and truthfully know that. We should really know that and never forget that. Because if not, um, I know I said it last year, but the, the, the stuff that's happening this year will cost many lives. You guys heard me say that last year. And that, that did, you know, that's not something that somebody equates that will happen. That kept coming out in prayer. That God has been really merciful. That we've had minimal loss of life through these events and people keep doing the same things over and over and over again. So the Lord will have open demonstration of his truth, not judgment, his truth. That's a simple truth. No one's going to mistake it when his judgment is in the earth. It'll happen everywhere. No, on the, on the opposite side of the corner that I'm telling you right now, there are many things that are devastating that are blessings in the skies. I'll tell you right now today, if that fire wouldn't have happened, all of the islands would have been lost. You're going to find that out later, that the fires were in fact the blessings, that some uh, something very bad was destroyed. And ironically, fire is the only thing that can destroy it. You're going to find that out later. In hindsight, if you look back, on many of these events that happen in the world, I'm telling you right now, God does what he does for you. Do you hear me? It's for you. He allows things for you. He does it for you. That's what he does. He had already given, he's given everybody a warning. And everybody knows what's right and wrong. And before the Lord moves upon a place to, dis, to, to get rid of something that can absolutely destroy the entire place, we've got to start paying attention. We do. We have to start paying attention. You're also going to hear that people spiritually has something in them that, uh, you know, go do what they do quickly and get out of that place. That's going to be replicated thousands of times in the rest of the parts of the earth. So don't think this is a one-off uh, situation in the fires in Hawaii. They had no place to escape to either. It's going to start happening all over the place. Let me continue with Romans. So let's find out who you are. So in Romans 11, chapter 11, verse 2, Elijah was speaking to the Lord and, the, and, and Israel had basically turned sour. And Elijah starts to speak because this is by his commentary. Romans 11.3, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They have digged down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? What answer did God give him? He says, listen, this is beautiful. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. God kept 7,000 men. He did so. He kept 7,000 men. Have you ever read the, some of the histories? dealing with the times of Isaiah and, and certain those men who were kept, they had unfortunate lives. They didn't get promoted. They didn't get picked for this, that, and the other. It seemed like they fell out of civilization. Sound familiar? Everybody else was getting, uh, you know, the world favored everybody else, but not these people who were, listen, preserved. They were preserved. So God was not going to lose them by way of promotion in Jezebel's armies. And all these uh, these kingdoms that existed at that time in their armies, he kept them. I'm telling you right now that many of you have been kept, you've been preserved. No, you couldn't make it big. No, you could not have it on easy street. No, things were not going to work out in your lives. That wasn't going to happen because if you walked out the world and became prosperous, you would be lost. You'd be partaking of the same sins the world does, and you would have an excuse for your lifestyle. That's the definition of lost. Is it not also delusional? So 7,000 men did not bow down to Baal, right? It says, even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. My goodness. Grace is something given to us, bestowed upon us. Grace is not anything that we have earned. 
That's why in the Bible it says God favors whom he favors. He favors whom he favors. So if you find yourself believing in Christ and you find yourself being no good in the world, you better thank God for that. Thank God that you're no good in the world. Those who are good at worldly things, they have their responsibilities and duties. But a great many of those are compromised because they can't so easily give up those things of the world. They go into any godly thing that would require all of them. They can't do that. Many of you, you could have taken a position up with the world. You could have pursued certain career fields in the world, but something in you would not let you commit to it 100%. You know, I had that same problem. There were areas I could have gone into, but there was a mechanism in me that was sabotaging everything I was doing. I'd have a hard core one day, the next day I was full of conflict, and I couldn't go through with it. And it would stop me from taking certain positions, doing certain things. It really would. It was getting in my way. Later on, I found out that's exactly what God did. To quite a few people, he kept. Now, when Jesus, uh, listen, if the remnant was talked about during this time, the time of the apostles, then you know that the remnant, there are people reserved right now. Now, we're not talking about a person who can't do anything in the world, yet they, they hate Christianity, too. That's not what we're talking about. But for the sake of righteousness, you can't do everything everybody else does. There were times I couldn't even go to a movie because I had a conflict inside. I gave away every piece of music I ever had because of a conflict inside. There was a time I gave away everything I ever owned because of the conflict inside. Everything I owned was getting in the way of my time with Christ. And it became a problem so much so I gave away everything. I had two favorite cars. They were songs. Almost black and almost red. And that's when they first came out, right? And, you know, every everybody who was part of government had stereo systems and movies and all that kind of stuff. I gave all that stuff away. Why? Because the conflict was that bad. It was that bad. I couldn't play a song without conflict entering into me. So guess what? I just gave it all up. I gave it all away. I had to free myself of all of that stuff. Let's continue. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace, uh, Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. If it's by grace, it's not of works. It's not something you earn, not something I purposely earned, something bestowed upon you. Just like your faith, just like you're given a measure of faith. God gave you a measure of faith. And if by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. And the rest were blinded. Isn't that what's happening? The rest are blinded. Now, this is Romans eleven seven is incredibly important. If the rest were blinded, God blinded them. Do you hear what I'm saying? If the rest were blinded by God, now a lot of people have an issue with this. Why would God pick this person to be saved and this person to be condemned? See, you shouldn't talk about what you don't understand. We shouldn't talk about what we don't understand. We don't know the conditions other than this life. No one has been dead, lived on the other side for a couple millennia to understand everything and come back and explain it to everybody else. So you have to get that out of your minds. God is not some cruel, wicked thing that came from Hollywood. That's not who he is. Let me give you a scenario. A child is born. The child is cute as a button. All of a sudden, a flood comes. The parents of the child are pinned under a wall. They can't even get to the child. So they have to watch that child drown. You think those people would have a problem with the living God? I think they would. I think those people would have an issue with the living God. If they believed in God, they would have an issue and say, why did you let my baby die? In fact, that's exactly what atheists say, isn't it? So let me give you what, what was really happening. You ready? This is alternate reality. Let me give you this scenario. That little baby was Hitler. So it was a baby just like every other baby. But the spirit that was in the baby did not come from the living God. Uh-oh. So it looked cute. It was cuddly. It was nice. It was their child. But it was Hitler. Did they cry when Hitler died? No. I don't recall anybody in history crying because they thought they killed Hitler. But a child, when no one knows what the spirit is, they assume every child is innocent. That body is just a container. What's in that body is precious, not the container. What's in that body will go on. I'm giving you an example of that were Hitler. And people knew it, they wouldn't cry. Now let me give you the other story. A person, and I believe this with all my heart, and I know it's going to cause a problem, but I'm going to say it anyway. A child is about to be born. The mother aborts the baby. Bad situation, right? Here's what I believe. 
I believe that God Almighty is God Almighty. Why in the world would he put a soul in a dying vessel just to experience death and affect nothing in the earth? God does not work that way. He does not work that way. Hope you guys knew that. God is not cruel. People get sucked up by concepts and ideologies, and they don't know what's happening in the spiritual realm. They assume. In the Bible it says, if an earthly father knows how to give, give uh, good gifts to his children, how much more? Our father. If I had the power to send a soul to a vessel in the earth, there's no way I would send a soul to a dying vessel. That would never have a chance. I would never do that. And if I would never do that, and our Father is so much better than anything we can ever, that we have a concept of, then why in the world would he do that? That would be in vain. That would serve no purpose, would it? The penalty would be the same. Because we cannot see. But I'm just telling you that God does not do things like that. There was a time that I was in bad shape. So how did the Lord separate me from the pain I was in? He did so. And I know why he did that. I know there are people out there right now. And he didn't separate their pain. And I know why. Because it's in the word of God. God already answered that. Listen to me. When you have a bloodlust to kill something, you're living by a weapon. You're going to feel the sting of that weapon. Do you hear what I'm saying? People used to ask me all the time. You want to go hunting? No, I do not. So long as there are grocery stores, I will not hunt. But in training, in certain times deployed, I do in a heartbeat so people can eat. But I'm not going to do it when they have grocery stores. In other words, I'm not killing a thing because there's no blood loss to me to kill. There's no joy in that for me. There's no sport in that for me. Why? Because I value what God created. That's why. I'm not going to have target practice on a deer just to say I killed a deer. Because our Father does not do anything in vain. And we are not to do anything in vain. And according to the word of God, who do you think taught mankind to build weapons in the first place? The father didn't give us the knowledge to build weapons. He didn't do that. That came from the other side. That's why in Revelation it says, and they will learn war no more. That's why every time God establishes something in the earth, peace is established. It is a bloodlust that people have. It's the same thing as rage, where they want to, you know, beat somebody else. That's a spirit that's in this earth. And it goes from person to person to person to person. If anything is legion, that thing is legion. It is very combative. So what I'm telling you guys is this. When it comes to spiritual things, and you have people on the earth who have never lived on a spiritual plane, they're experts on the spiritual realm. Are you kidding me? Is that a joke? You're going to watch for these things. And don't think my hands are not stained. My hands are stained more than anybody's here. I'm telling you that now. They're stained. Not from an animal either. My hands are stained. This body I'm in is condemned. There is no glorification of this body. But through Christ, I exist. I do not exist outside of Christ. Because I know the penalty of my own actions. I know what I've taken away from others. My hands are stained more than anybody else. And I know what I'm talking about. But I can also tell you that when you have a born-again spirit, your life is not governed by lusts anymore. Not by pride. You don't just all of a sudden get angry. There's no more anger. Frustration is gone. There's only patience. There's kindness and sobriety. There's the word of God. Lots of care and power. That's what's left. You don't work by the power of anger anymore. You work by the power of love, which is far more than anger could ever be. People have taught people how to utilize or harness anger as a motivational starting point for everything they do as a source of strength. Anger is weakness. When a person gets angry, they have lost already. When a person has no patience, they have lost already. When we lose our tempers, we have lost. When you maintain your civility, not fakely, but truthfully, and that only love comes forward, now you're being a vessel. Follow me on this, because none of this should be strange to any of you. Many of you have heard about it. You may not be doing it. You may not be doing it because you don't realize who you are. I'm going to give you the answer to something here. How many of you, after you find out that you have sin, you feel bad for it? If you've ever felt bad behind a specific sin or sins, that's why you can be forgiven. Here's the mechanism behind it. When you feel bad for the sin that you did and you regret doing it in the first place, the truth is you did that sinful thing in ignorance. Ignorance means you don't know. Had you known of that sin, you would not have done it. So here's what the Lord does. When you feel bad about sinning in the first place, that means your conscience is responding to something very true. That conviction. When you respond to conviction, it means if you could go back and do it, you wouldn't do it again. 
so then you can be forgiven. Why? Because had you known what you were actually doing at that time, you would not have done it in the first place. That's why you're forgiven. But a person who does not deeply sorry for the sin they committed, they have no conviction behind it. They cannot be forgiven. They can't. See, forgiveness is not a mechanism by paperwork that works. Forgiveness is very real. God is just to forgive. When we repent, part of repentance is when you feel sorry for that sin that you did. And it's on your conscience. There are some people who sin, they don't feel sorry. And they would do it again. Those people were never forgiven in the first place. Why? Because of their very souls, they're not sorry for what they did. And if they could go back and do it, they'd do it again. So they did what they did in a type knowing, and they would not take it back. You did what you did in a type of ignorance. Because if people knew the penalty of sin, that it would surely cause their death and separation. If a believer truly understood that and was mindful about that at the time of their sin, and they were mindful about what it would cause in somebody else's life, so on and so forth, they wouldn't have done it. So they can be forgiven. Repentance is on the inside. When you start feeling like that, it's on the inside. So that when you turn away from that sin, you really never do it again. That sin is gone. The blood of the Lamb takes care of that. You're clean of that. There is no anything, no rest, do no anything of that. Now, we can always look at our flesh and understand that through our giving in to the desires of flesh, we did enter into sin. The Bible says the body does not sin apart from itself. But we have to agree to sin in order for sin to be fully manifest, right? And it, it starts in the body. It starts in the body. But we never have to go back to have our lives led by the desires of our bodies. When you repent, you're more led by the desires of spirit. Which is why in the Bible it says God will give you the desires of your heart, but only after you seek you first kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. After you've made that transition, God will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because once you make that transition, your set of desires is spiritually bound. It has nothing to do with the flesh. Your flesh desires to stay alive. Your flesh desires to continue. Your flesh desires to mate. Your flesh desires to eat all of what it can eat. So greed and all those things are involved in the desires of flesh. But guess what? We don't walk by flesh anymore, do we? But by the spirits. To walk by the flesh is to have your life guided by desires of flesh. To walk by the spirit is to have your life guided by those things of the spirit. Those that walk of the spirit are dead to the flesh. And that's something. So even though I can look at my own flesh and I know every single thing I did of the flesh, I've never done anything by mistake. I've never denied my own sin. Everything was premeditated. I know what I agree to and, and, and you know, all these different things. I can look at my flesh and say, thank you, Lord. I'll never forget it. But every time I see somebody else's sin, it's only a reflection of my own flesh. Do you guys see that? That's why I don't condemn people. I don't condemn other people because they, if a person is out there sinning right now, they're nothing less than what I was. I was the same thing. So I don't really go out with the business of condemnation. That's why in the Bible it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which were in Christ Jesus. Walk not after the things of the flesh, but in the Spirit. Because you're walking in the Spirit, there's no condemnation. Why? Because you're separated from the deeds of your flesh. When Jesus died, he took all that upon himself of your flesh. When he was resurrected, he was a new creature indeed. He was something beyond the flesh. See, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So he was something beyond the flesh. And that's something. So when you are separated from the deeds of your flesh when you repent, but there are people out there. That's, that's why abortion, uh, murder, and all these things. Once you have repented of such, no matter how bad it was, you forgive it. Now Satan's going to use everything you ever did to try and draw you back down into the dumps. Don't let him. But every time he brings up your past, all he's doing is bringing up your testimony. Hope you know that. So when you're around family and they cannot see the transitioned you, all they see is the old you. So when they drudge up your past, that's an opportunity for that testimony. You can look them right in the eye and say, that's right, I did that and worse. You're not getting it all right. I did worse than that, but not like that anymore. Because they'll see a true change. That's why they bring up your past in the first place. Because they'll look at you and say, well, you're not the same anymore. Well, you're different. What is, you used to be this way. And they start bringing stuff up like that because they can't, they can see the change. That's why they bring it up. That's why it's an opportunity. That's an opportunity moment. It really is. There's no shame in that, right? There's no shame in that because you're not who you used to be. Oh, and you're about to read your far more than that. But the Lord is good. He's very good. And although people have theories and although people, sometimes in our theories, we deny everything that was established in the New Testament. We do. People go back to the Old Testament 
which is black and white. But we have to remember something. Every time you read the New Testament, you read where Jesus gives answer to the Old Testament why things happen and the new standard he set. Which, by the way, that new standard is a living standard. Through Christ, redemption was established and is established. It was established no other way. That's also a message of the New Testament. That's why the gospel is truly the good news. I'm going to continue, though. Romans 11.8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Now, we were, remember, we were talking about Romans 11.7. What then Israel had not obtained that which seeketh for but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So those who were reserved, those 7,000 men who were reserved, God did that by grace. What about the rest of them? They were blinded. Listen, and it, it, it gives you further information here. So we have 7,000 people who by grace were reserved and did not bow down to Baal or Baal. But the rest were blinded, which is why they did what they did. Now keep in mind, they were blinded. This is an action. That's a verb. They were blinded. Something happened to them, right? Something God did. Let's continue to read Romans 11, 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Who gave them the spirit of slumber? God did. Not the devil. God did. Listen. He gave them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Did you hear that? So who did that? God did that. Who made them blind? God did. Who made them deaf? God did. Do you hear that? See, we're going to get this thing right. Because there are so many times that people think, well, you know, the devil's winning. He, no, he's not winning. It's impossible for him to win. He, he has never won. He cannot win. He's not here to win. He's doing something else. And if you don't know what he's doing, you can be blindsided. But more specifically, you need to know what your father has done. And he didn't do it just to be cruel. No. See, we, oh, we forget so much. What if God wanted somebody to be redeemed that never asked for forgiveness? Can he do it? Let me tell you something. God can do whatever he wants to do. God gave us rules. We don't give him rules. God gave us things to live by. We don't give him things to live by. God gave us a definition of life. We don't give him the definition of life. We need to really consider that because we're overstepping our bounds. And many of these theories that I hear that are out there, people are assuming somehow they have power over the living God, saying what God cannot do. They need to stop saying that. That's just not, that's not sober thinking. People do that to stay comfortable in the information that they have so they stay relevant. Information does not make you relevant. God made you relevant. But God can also blind you and make you deaf and have you that you cannot hear. Take note of that. But that's not what he did, did he? He put a belief in you for his son. Never take that for granted. It doesn't matter how bad you've been in this life. If you believe in Christ, God put that in you to be saved, not to be lost or condemned. Do you hear what I'm saying? You were always to be recovered. Don't let these tricky words of Satan enter into your mind and all of a sudden you come up with this new theory of how existence is. See, that's what happens when men think they're too wise and they say within themselves, we have figured out God. No, they have not. They most certainly have not. They can't even figure out each other. How are they going to figure out the living God? According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, a trap, a stumbling block, a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and to bow down their back away. Now a lot of people read this as some type of, Lord make them blind where they can't see and hear. They're messing that all up. That's not something you use as a curse. David, when he spoke, he spoke on behalf of what God was doing. Do you know that? When David spake, he spake about Christ. That's exactly what the Messiah said. Uh-oh, we forgot about that one. So when these prayers of David that are coming out, these are decrees. And he spoke toward Christ, the Savior that was coming. See, for a long time, people replicate this stuff. And I've even heard people say, God darkened their, or darkened their eyes so they can't see. I've heard people say that. That's witchcraft. That's what that is, witchcraft. God does not agree with you. He has already done what he did. Just as you get mad at a group of people, he will not evoke his own word against them for your sake. To do an evil in the world? That, no, because you've got to know why God darkened their eyes, why he blinded them, why he made them deaf. He did not do it because they were bad people. That's not why he did it. See, that, that's the whole thing here. If we're not careful, we're going to mess this whole thing up. Start operating on these false premises. They're going to continue to grow, which becomes a false religion. And then we're going to end up worshiping something that is certainly not Christ. We have a good father. 
not a bloodthirsty father. It's not what we have. So anyway, and David said, let the people be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. Always means always. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Oh, this, see, thank you, Lord. Listen, listen. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they would fall? Has God done this to them so bad that they can never get up? God forbid, but rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. My goodness. Do you see that? God did that on purpose so we can have the word. Part of his process. He knows what he's doing. My goodness. And if God would open your eyes to see his actual plan, you couldn't help but to give him praise every single day because you would see no evil in his ways whatsoever. And you would marvel. You would marvel at what he's actually done. While everybody else is crying and boohooing, you would marvel and praise. We read Romans 11, 11 again. I say then, have they stumbled that they should not fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation has come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Thank you, Lord. We do not move without provocation. We will sit there lazy in our homes until something goes wrong, and then we get up. If nothing goes wrong, we have no reason to get up when we start to rot where we are. I'm telling you what I know, not what I read. Telling you what I know. So then things happen to motivate us to get up. And normally things have to fall apart to get us to move. Otherwise, we're stubborn as mules. We're just like a mule. We will not move until we deem we want to move. So things go wrong and then we get up and move. Only through your movements to see what went wrong do you begin to realize other aspects of your life. That's the only way. That's how it's been for, for, since we've been here. The same thing over and over and over again. We're just not familiar with those ways because we have a, this sense of pride with us. Like we have figured some things out and we have not. Clearly, we have not. And this, you know what's so funny? This Romans 11, 11, you know how everybody, everybody says, Oh, I see 11, 11 everywhere. Well, go read Romans 11, 11. Because that is so needed for people to understand right now. Of all the scriptures, if they could only understand this one, their life would not be so chaotic. So let's go to Romans eleven twelve. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So the ones that went blind, if God made them blind where they couldn't hear, where they couldn't obey, where they couldn't agree, where they couldn't do this and the other, if he did that so the world could be rich, with his, with his spirit, and so that the Gentiles would be rich through the diminishing of his own people. He says, how much more is going to be their fullness? Fullness of who? The people that went blind, the people that couldn't hear. How much more is their fullness going to be? See, are you guys seeing that? If God made them blind and couldn't hear and they couldn't agree and all this kind of stuff for the sake of the world and the Gentiles, then you know they're going to be elevated when God restores them. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to, to the emulation them which are in my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the word, what shall the receiving of them be? But life from the dead. He says, for if the casting away of them, his God's people, the Israelites, where the whole thing started, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? What shall the receiving of the Israelites be? If they were made blind and couldn't hear, couldn't agree, couldn't believe in Christ and all this other stuff for the sake of the reconciliation of the world, then what's going to happen when God restores them? My goodness, that's going to be a sight of signs. If they were utilized... For the reconciliation of the world, for the salvation of the world and the Gentiles. What's going to happen when they're restored? That was Romans 11.15, which is beautiful. Listen, for if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted among them, and within partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. Don't elevate yourself above. Listen, you know how when we're out here in the world, we look at the sinners and say, they don't know what they're doing. I thank God we have the word. They don't know what they're Stop doing that. God's doing what he's doing for a reason. And no evil is in it. Have you, haven't you noticed there's a season? There was a season through your life where you could not believe. 
and there was a season of your life when you went back home and you grew and then another season comes where you can't comprehend and do you not know that through that season of your incomprehension and those seasons where you could not believe, but you still were marked for salvation, that through you others were provoked to look deeper in the word of God, just like you are provoked to look deeper in the word of God when you face people just like that in your own lives. Haven't you guys noticed that only when you face a person who does not believe to the extent that you do, are you provoked to go back into the Word of God to dig deeper, and you always extract wisdom. Haven't you noticed that process? I know somebody asked me one day, they're a minister, they said, uh, they say, you know, I'm getting tired every time, you know, people talking against this, and that. I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What are you trying to do? Disarm yourself. If nobody spoke against you, you would not be provoked to go into the Word of God and that Word be enriched in your speaking. The reason why you have so much to say is because so many are going against you and you're refining yourself. That provokes you to go back into the word of God. In other words, you may not think these folks around you have placement, but I'm telling you right now, God knows they have placement and they would not exist if they served no purpose. God does not make anything in vain. We have to swallow that fact. Can't you see that? Come on now, somebody's got to start saying some, something is a bit different, isn't it? I know the pride we have in our flesh, where we want to have the whole thing figured out. And we become prideful because we spent hours and hours of research in scriptures and we put something together and it looks logical. And we start defending it because we have invested so much time in it. I know that. I know how people can defend other folks because they love them and trust them and they will defend them. But there was always, always a season coming of absolute reconciliation. When the word of God would be full in the saints. I personally believe we have reached that season. And a great giving is underway. I'm talking about things really being turned around. Not just by speech and declaration. And we're everything aligning with God's truth. And if these be the end days, nothing will hold back the marble of the Holy Ghost. Let's continue. Remember the casting away of them was a reconciliation of the world. Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast... Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. You know what he just says? Stop having the answer to things we cannot see. Stop putting puzzle pieces together that are spiritual and not meant for any of us to know right now. You need not do that, but to be stewards over what you've been given understanding of. We're always on the hunt, aren't we? We're always on the hunt, aren't we? Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. That's a warning. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God, of them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not, still in unbelief shall be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again again and again I'm so thankful for that Romans 11:23. and they also if they abide not still in unbelief so if they start changing and believe after they have had a season of belief and then unbelief it says they're going to be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again for if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, he's talking about the Gentiles, and were grafted contrary to the nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree then? So the ones who were blinded, the ones who are deaf, the ones that people judge, point fingers at, they're coming back. They're secured in the Lord's hands. We're not going to change their minds. The Lord is going to bring them back in. That's why you read in certain passages, when, when Jesus comes back, they're going to go up to Jesus and say, who put these holes in your hands? And he'll say, my friends did this to me. But you'll also notice they didn't know who Jesus was. Because if they're saying, who put these holes in your hands, they didn't even know who he was. Yet he came back to them. So what you're seeing now, this world and upheavals and everything else, what is it? Why is this stuff happening? Provocation for you. Had the world not been bad, you wouldn't have hunted for the Lord. When things start going wrong, 
you open up your Bibles. When things are going right and the weather is calm, you feel you have no placement whatsoever. Time to go ahead and force that one. Don't tuck that one away under a pillow. Because you had people in times of seasons of peace, relative peace. They were enjoying things of the Lord. And you said to yourself, I can't really enjoy it. But when things went wrong, when the contrary happened in the land where the believers were, you said, I knew this time was coming. And you began to wake up. This describes you. But your, more notably is this. Who has those characteristics? Who in the world is it that God would ever send to this earth that only wakes up in times of trouble? Here it is. Those who would not bow their knee to Baal. The 7,000 who would not bow down to Baal. Those of you, the remnant. You're the remnant. You're the ones who have placement when things go wrong. You're the ones preserved, not given over to the world. You're the ones that felt when things were too peaceful, you had no purpose. And when things go wrong, something woke up inside of you. You're just like they are. You're being described here. You are being described here. That's why you did not bow to these compromises in the world. You couldn't do it. We didn't have all the information right, but guess what? We weren't falling for things either. We could see right through them. Well, everybody else was saying, oh, they were embracing these weird things. You said, uh-uh, something's not right here. I'm not going to embrace this. The only people that do that in this book are those who have been preserved. That's who you are. That's why you, you get on fire when people start, start talking about the end times. And the other people don't understand you, do they? When things are peaceful, they stand up. When things go wrong, you stand up. Do you guys see? God didn't make a mistake. Why do you think you've been through hell on earth? Why? I, I tell you something. A generation is almost done leaving the earth. A complete generation. They're almost done being removed from the face of the earth. They started leaving in 2021. This specific generation happened to be the same people that were telling people, hey, you go to church on Sunday. Hey, Sonny, don't you go to Bibles? They were full of faith, full of soundness, the backbones of many families. Do you not know that that entire generation has almost gone home? Do you know why? See, there's a principle behind this. Right now, we're just reading about the principle of you, why you are like you are. But there's another principle of a season that when all those people who are the anchors of faith, when they leave, is so that the remnant can stand up. That means you're soon to be positioned. And you're only to be positioned during calamitous times. So don't be afraid of it. Don't ever be afraid of it. You're to be positioned when the things go wrong in the world. And what do you see happening in the world? What do you see? You see things starting to go wrong, don't you? The peace of many has been disturbed. You don't have to be frightened of it. Because if you knew everything behind it, you'd be like, wow, this needs to be. Let's hurry up and get there. Because you're not going to be in this time by yourselves. You have no idea what you're going to feel like at the height of, I, I, I can tell you this, not one of you is going to be scared and want to go back home in a hurry. You don't have fear when you have the Holy Ghost. You don't operate by fear anymore. Fear is ejected and forbidden to come back to you ever again. And when you do not operate by fear, it's pure soberness of spirit. The remnant is special because they're already primed to house something that hardly nobody else was ever appointed to carry. And when the season comes, so shall it. And you're not going to have the same mindset that you have right now. You're not. You're pressing right now. You're making decisions right now. You're establishing things in your life right now. But the help is coming. You were never expected to stand by yourself during the time of the end without the help. The help is coming. And you're instrumental. Oh, and here's that undeniable thing. That word, when, whenever I say you've been preserved, how many of you, there's a mechanism in you that you're familiar with that, though your mind is not familiar with it. Whenever that word preserved is used, why is it that spiritually you have understanding of it? But by way of your mind, you can make no sense of it. Not absolutely. What do you think that is? How can you spiritually have understanding of it? That means your faith. Because of your faith, the Lord is your help. The Holy Spirit is your help. Him protecting the elect, the Lord protecting the elect. Right now you're pressing. Right now the filter is upon you. But you're meant for solutions, not further aggravation, not confusion, not all that stuff. So you live in very different times. And it's, it's funny because many of you share the same attributes. Isn't that funny? You share the exact same attributes. And you have a desire. One of the biggest things is 
you have a you have a desire to serve the Lord in truth, in absolute truth. Now we have contradictions to that. We do. Or you would, you know, if that if you didn't have those contradictions, you would be pure. You have those contradictions, which means you can identify elements of yourself that you're going to have to get over. But you have a heart and a strong desire to serve the Lord. And that normally has gotten you into trouble. Would you say that's right? Out of your sincerity. And you can't quite figure out how people can are missing your sincerity. When these scriptures are put together and you read them in context, the whole chapter like we just did, right? When you start looking at this in context, it changes a few things, doesn't it? Now, granted, Romans 11 is often pulled. These things are pulled out of context. And you can't see the whole thing. The entire subject was about Israel, how they had killed the prophets. And they were doing this, that, and the other. But there were 7,000 men whom the Lord preserved that would not bow to any dark overlord. Right? They didn't bow that he preserved. Them. But he purposely blinded his people to do what they did so that other things could be established. And then he's saying he's going to restore the first he, that he blinded. Now, in a blindness, listen to me, when you're blinded, made deaf, and you do all these things by the Lord, if you believe, you're still going to believe. You're just going to have a lot of uh, stuff that goes on with you in your life. Those who refuse to believe are fully given over to it. They're just fully given over to it. Those who still believe, but are just simply hard-headed, they're going to be restored. God said he would restore them. But the purpose of their blindness, blindness was so that the world could be reconciled unto the living God through Christ. Do you see what's happening here? Beyond the wisdom of all mankind, the Lord is working. People can scarcely sometimes understand what the Lord is doing, yet he never stops doing it. He's working beyond all of the wisdom and the, the, the cunning of mankind. Why do you think mankind always changes what they think will happen at the end? Every single year it changes because they were wrong the first time. Yet the Lord has been quite consistent in what he's doing. This is about salvation. It's about the Lord's method, not ours. We're but babies in this world. We are. But make no mistake, you're purposed during the time you live in. If you don't extract anything else, you better understand this. You were placed in this time for a purpose. You're not going to be purposeless, but you were just told you have to be provoked to wake up. You will be provoked to wake up. So when people come up to you messing with you in your life, right, you take it a certain way. They don't understand how you're taking it, so don't expect them to. You're the one being provoked. And what does it cause? It causes you to go and inspect the word deeper and deeper and deeper because you've been preserved for this time. And this is not the same time everybody else has been living in. People are trying to normalize it. They're doing a poor job. It's not working. It's not working at all. So the Lord's not making mistakes here. And man's paradigm is but foolishness in the face of God. I hope we know that. People want so desperately to be the one that has figured God out. Nobody's going to figure out the Lord. If we can understand that we're but children, then we can also understand that we have a good father. If we can understand that we have a good father, then we can also understand that everything that's been transpiring in our lives is for the edification of the body of Christ that remnant in the world that will actually be saved, that the Lord is refining us, and that everything we've been operating by is soon to change. But that's based in the Lord's timing. It's not man's timing. It's not in man's power. It's in the Lord's timing. What are y'all talking about millennial? Now, please don't talk about the millennial nonsense. This is only about Christ. People dream up stuff like that because they like to have control. They're not going to have control over God's gospel. They forget that. They're not going to have control over it. No matter what they title their ideology, that all that stuff is foolishness. And we're trying to walk out of foolishness into the realm of truth, which is our Father is in charge of this thing, not mankind. These other ideologies in the world are but foolishness. It's a bunch of nonsense. That's why we look to Christ only. Only look to Christ, nobody else. That's important not to look to anybody else, not man. Not, not a president, not anybody else, but Christ. Christ only. That's why people continue to ask me, well, what's your denomination? I'm a believer in Christ. Oh, well, I mean, but what is it? I'm a believer in Christ. Because they want me to say, well, I'm a Protestant or Methodist. I'm not any of those things. I'm a believer in Christ. That's my affiliation. All the rest of that other stuff is for other people. This is about believers in Christ. This is about hearing Christ. Not operating by man's checklist. 
right, to fit in his little gangs and his little party here and party there. We're not doing that here. This is about Christ. Listen, I don't follow Gamatria either. When, when people say numbers are significant, well, they can believe that. You'll never hear me say that. I don't do the number thing. I don't do any of the atrias. I don't do that, right? I know what's underlying of all of it. And I will not entertain anything that man has had his hands in tainting. Man has tainted Gamatria. Gamatria started not from Moses and his crew, but from the other ones that popped up to try to usurp Moses and the word he gave to the people. When you start finding out the true story about that, you start leaving all these earthly doctrines behind. You, you leave them behind. They have warped the minds of a lot of people so much. Like last time we were talking about the rapture, you have people out there saying, well, if you don't believe in the rapture, you're just not going to be saved. That's nonsense. We're saved by grace. It is a gift of God, not because we believe or don't believe in somebody's concept. My goodness, so we don't, we don't, we don't even elevate subjects like that. That's why we don't have bylaws and try laws and who laws and do laws. We don't do that stuff. We're Christ-centric. And people are free here. No one's going to dictate anything. No, 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 no. This is about looking to Christ and operating spiritually, not by some earthly mandate that has failed time and time again. We're not doing that. People love structure and control. In this place, people are learning to give up control back to the living God to be led of the Lord. That's one of the biggest problems in today's world. People lead themselves. Somebody says, question, how do you know you believe in the millennial reign? But you know, but who called it the millennial reign? Who did that? Where is that at in the Bible? I, I never saw that in the Bible. Oh, that's one of man's categories, right? The millennial reign, that's what he calls it, which equates to what? A thousand years, that's what he calls it. Right? I never use that term, millennial reign, never. Why? Because that's how man, mankind categorizes things. Listen to me carefully. If man can put and, and put something into a category, they will next seek to control it. Once they control it, they'll pervert it. Once it's perverted, it's distorted. And when it's distorted, then the true nature of it is totally lost. See, while a lot of people are thinking about the millennial, whatever it is, instead of a thousand year reign, instead of a thousand years, they're also trying to put it in, into some calendar. I never do that. God will choose when he begins his own thing. He'll do that. I don't need to categorize that. I like things simple. But man has this insatiable desire to feel important, to feel like somehow they came up with it. I don't do that. I don't, I don't like those terms. I try my best to get away from those terms. Because uh, it's, even like Jesus said, Jesus said, I know the spirit that's in man. Yeah, it's very proud, boastful. It carries all the attributes of a reprobate mind. That's what it does. But I tend to get away from this stuff in the world. This stuff in the world has done real damage to the minds of so many. How is it that people have actually fought over what is millennial and what is not? People have fought. There, people have fought over this. People have hurt each other over this. I'll not entertain that nonsense. That's nonsense. All these things that cause people to fight, I don't talk about that. I don't talk about the rapture. I don't talk about those things. I don't do that. I said man-made nonsense, and people tend to fight over those subjects. That's why we don't have those same, you know, platforms of, of, of fighting here. We don't do that. I certainly don't want it. That's not what I'm here for. People are going to have to deal with some very real things. While everybody's arguing about when that starts, they're going to have to face what they thought they'd never face. And I'm telling you right now, people are going to be sitting in the corners of their houses, frightened, scared to death to go outside. Keep in mind that the Bible says men's hearts are going to fail them for fear for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. And then it immediately says, the seas and the waves roar. Maybe mankind is going to realize, and they're doing it right now, forecasting. The absolute changes that are taking place in the earth, it is so bad they're not going to warn a soul. They're not going to, because if people had half the mind to truly prepare, I, I guarantee you, they'd be having, they'd be doing nothing that was fun and games right now. They would spend all their time in preparation and conditioning is what they would do to condition themselves to expect the Lord's word to unfold, not according to man. And that's what's going to get everybody because if people had a rightful picture of prophecy and how it would unfold, nobody's hearts would fail them for fear. What makes a heart fill you for fear is when things happen you never thought would ever happen. I'll give you a truth. You ready? Something has been watching each and every one of you. Something's been watching your families, and it is physical, and it's not humanity. It's not E.T. either. Something has been watching you because at an appointed time, they're coming forward, 
and every single person who entertain their ways, they will come and get. Darkness is coming for darkness. Darkness is not coming for light. Darkness is coming for darkness. There is no escape, and there is no weapon, and there is no defense. Darkness is coming for darkness. So for person, God has given them a lifetime to get some things settled out. If they rejected that and refused to do it or called themselves fooling everybody else, darkness is coming for darkness. And all those who operated by darkness, they will not escape. There is no escape, there is no defense, and they will not die. But that will be the beginning of torment for them. That's what's reserved for those who continually and actively try to usurp everything about the living God and Christ in the earth. God is so gracious that they still live on, that they may repent. But a time will come when there will be no more repentance. There will be no more forgiving. And only a fool would ask for that day to hurry up and come. Because there's no good in those days at all. If the Most High does not directly protect you, you will be lost. Salvation is real. My prayer is that we learn quickly never to play with salvation. Never to play with the opportunity of coming to Christ. Never take for granted the information in the Word of God that people have within themselves. And that's been distributed all over the earth, but that we utilize what the Lord has given this, given us in this hour to start the transition. Because one day, all of it will be taken away. You'll have no Bible. It'll be very difficult to find a person who would ever speak a scripture. The years of abominations are coming, and nothing is going to stop it. And every single day, mankind has this stronger and stronger desire to see the unknown. Well, I got news for you. The veil has protected us from the unknown for a long time. Through desire, the veil opens, and man has a brand new desire for the unknown. So you might want to make sure that you're absolutely ready, because the Lord has already told us that the words of the prophets at that time are going to fail. They're going to be speechless. Pastors will be speechless. No one's going to have an answer, and then people will be so frightened, their hearts are going to stop. So it's not a playful time. People are getting a taste, slowly but surely, of a build-up. And God is very kind in doing that, because the season is coming regardless. Listen, it's based on a specific number of Gentiles coming into the fold. When that number is completed, well, then all bets are off. Everything will begin to happen all at one time. And it will not be expected by the world. It will take people by surprise. But I hope that we are serious about salvation and can realize your life has been, your life is not a mistake. It is highly purposed. But be careful with this worldly stuff. It will permeate your mind. It causes confusion. We know that Satan is the author of confusion. That's all this worldly stuff does. Refrain from it. Try not to build a bridge between these sinful things in this world and the holiness of the word of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ given to us. There are bridge builders out there making a hybrid gospel. I pray that you're not going to partake in that, but that's just a prayer you have to ultimately decide for yourselves. And the biggest thing, take no one for granted in your life. People in your life are purpose to be in your life. If you trust your Father, then you'll find purpose in all things. His purpose, not just any purpose, but His purpose. That's when we go back and open up the Word and begin to see the truth of what's been happening in our lives. You need not curse your past. The Lord has been in your past. He's in your right now. And if you belong to him and you have life tomorrow, he's going to be in your tomorrow. So long as you continually believe. And by the way, he put that belief in you that you would not be lost. So if you actually believe in the Messiah, you actually believe in forgiveness, you actually believe in repentance. If you actually believe those things and you believe in Christ, you cannot believe in Jesus Christ and disagree with his gospel. The world is going to redefine Christ. I hope you know that. I hope you are prepared because that false religion is coming forward and many, many will be his disciples. Well, I will not be one of them. That's why I do not accept any of this new stuff. And I seek to simplify everything back to the root of what Christ gave us, not trying to sound important and add this vernacular to my speech. That is just, it, 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 it's harmful at best, especially in the New Testament when it said, we're to communicate things plainly and simply when it comes to the Word of God, not being like a hypocrite. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, go into your secret place 
Don't think you're going to be heard for your many words like the hypocrites do. That's why I say do your good deeds in secret that your father may reward you openly. In other words, be true. Be authentic behind what you do. Don't do what you do for show. The same person you hear right now talking through this microphone should be the exact same person you hear of me every single day of my life. And it is exactly what you hear, which makes me boring. The same way I'm talking to you guys at COT is the same way I communicate every single day. I don't get off the air and talk differently and start cursing, start talking about other subjects. My number one subject is what bores most. You know what that is? Christ and everything about our Father. These times will not be kind to everybody, and life, lives will be lost. How many more hints do we need? Before I go, I want to share this with you. You guys need not look for the big things. Listen to me. While everybody's looking for the big, sensational things to happen to take many lives all at one time, these small events have been consuming everything, and they're not slowing down. Have you noticed that? I've noticed with the Lord, He'll often do things this way. He'll have an event that will do part of its purpose, but almost like drips of water. That never stop. So instead of filling up the bucket with a lot of noise with the valve fully open, the Lord allows it to drip, and it's dripping faster and faster. Now one thing about a drip, you'll notice a drip for the first couple days, but then it'll still drip, but you don't hear the drip anymore. You tune it out because it continues. Have you noticed that? If you let something drip four or five days, you're going to stop hearing it drip because you'll tune it out. Anything that happens and is continuous, you tend to tune it out. People have tuned out earthquakes, haven't they? No one jumps or gets excited or comes to any conclusions about these small 4.0 earthquakes and 5.0 earthquakes. They have not stopped. They have increased. They're still going, but people have tuned them out. When was the last time you heard about any local crime being just put all over the news? You haven't heard about that. Why? They've tuned it out. The crime rate is higher now than it ever has been historically. Do you know that? You wouldn't think that looking at any news agency. You would not think that. There are more children being snatched up today than at any other time in history. There are more people dying of overdoses than we've ever had before worldwide. There are things happening so bad now, but people have tuned them out. And the numbers are increasing, sometimes exponentially. And they go to fanciful subjects like UAPs to capture everybody's attention while something else is happening altogether. They told you that the oceans are hotter than at any other time in recorded history, yet people aren't they aren't paying attention to that. They told everybody that outside of Florida, the waters were 111 to 121 degrees. You know what people said? Well, tell us more about UAPs. They don't care about the ocean's heating. They have Folks have no idea what this is going to lead to. They finally admitted that the atmosphere is holding more moisture than they ever thought possible. Most of the predictions for the weather model where they said if the temperature goes up, you know, 1.2 degrees, the earth is doomed. It has already surpassed 7.7 .7 degrees. Nobody cares. The earth is literally about to cause massive death upon the planet, and people don't care. Cities are going to be lost by sinkholes, and people don't care because they keep chasing the sensational. We're not thorough enough with the small happenings because people lose interest in less than a week. You guys remember the earthquake in Turkey? How significant that was. That was groundbreaking. Do you guys remember what I said here at COT? Give it a week and a half to two weeks and nobody's going to discuss it. Nobody discusses the Turkey earthquake. If this were to happen in 2007 and anybody were to find out some of the trends that we now live in the middle of, they would swear on everything they are that the end times are here and that all life is about to end. That's how significant these changes are. But just like the rains of Noah, people saw a couple of trips of water here, no big deal. But a storm came. People said, well, we'll protect ourselves from the waters and keep going to higher ground. They only panicked when they couldn't go to higher ground to escape the water. They only panic when they find out there's no way out. They only panic when they find out that what has been happening has overtaken them. Do you know Jesus made that declaration upon these times? He said, they knew not till the flood came and took them all away. So shall also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So they're not going to panic until the day comes where they have no escape. What does that tell you? That things are going to continue to build up. They're taking their toll now. These things are taking their toll. Do you not know that a big percentage of our infrastructure here in America is destroyed? That they had to allocate a whole bunch of money to fix the highways that broke down this year. They've even opened up some of the valve systems inside some of these lakes that you guys are familiar with. 
You thought that was natural water going to the lakes? No. They know of water stores in the earth that everybody has forgotten about. But they actually had to open some up for the sake of military bases. In other words, they can fill up a lake without rain. So whenever you see that, that simple distribution of water, all these freshwater lakes are coming from underground sources, and they know what those things are. So they took charge of it, concreted in the exit ways of this water, and stuck a bow system in there. So they control what water goes into a lake. Oh, and by the way, this, these were established back in the 1500s, 15s to the 1700s. Oh, yes, and there are stories where they filled up an entire lake twice. But that's of no interest, because it's not UAP, and people aren't going to look that up, because it never changed. In fact, in that article, it showed at least seven, 17 to 20 different lakes that were this way. And it told you about the water. The water is so pure, crystal, and clean that they're letting into the lakes. Ah, it's good. No contaminants, no anything. Yet they're talking about the Colorado River drying up and people are about to starve. No, they, they, they know what they're doing. They get people on the edge. And then all of a sudden, guess what they do? When people get on the edge and they think, oh, it's over, what do they do? All of a sudden, the situation is corrected and nobody even remembers the story. Remember the Great Lakes and the water situation with China? What happened to that story? As soon as it picks up momentum, things change. Soon they're going to have to cover the fires under the ground in New York City. The fires in Chicago under the ground. The sinkholes that swallow up half of the city. They're going to have to cover this stuff. But they won't be able to, uh, you know, just wash that one away. These are the issues and situations that are going to get worse and worse. But I can tell you right now, people are not going to be concerned until it overtakes them. That means those of you in America, you can go out your front door right now and say there's no revelation. But if you were in the Middle East and certain parts and open up your front door, you would say this has got to be the end of revelation. See what we're used to doing? Just because something does not happen to us, we dictate that everybody else is wrong. Revelation is not happening because it's so peaceful here. Yeah, but it's not peaceful anywhere else. And they're propping up the picture of everything being normal in America. And it is not normal in America.